Good morning. Uh, we're glad to be together today on this Sunday morning. We are looking forward to God's Word, and uh, I know you are too. That's why you're with us. Thank you for joining with us. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to John chapter 15. We are marching through John, this final discourse of Jesus Christ, as he speaks to, he ministers to his disciples this last evening before he goes to the cross. And so I want us to, uh, to look at this really important passage we're going to be in John 15, the first uh, 17 verses together this morning. Our focus is going to be really uh, looking at the life, the mission of the believer. So the Lord is going to use a, a metaphor to describe our relationship uh, to him. One that we know well uh, is, is very familiar, yet it's, uh, it's very challenging and it's very powerful in our life. And when we stop to contemplate and consider what he's telling us, uh, we need to clearly take heed. Uh, and that we would be those who would be described as those who have ears to hear and uh, listen to his word and, and bring it into our life. John chapter 15, he brings the word picture, the metaphor of the vine and the branches. So I'm looking forward to this. We're going to look at this this morning. It's very much an agricultural example, an illustration that he uses, one that they would have known well. Uh, we don't use agriculture as much in today, but a lot of us still do plants and flowers and some do uh, gardening. I do gardening. We enjoy that very much. It's great to be outside. Some of the, some of the greatest uh, lessons that I have learned and continue to be reminded of are when I'm in the yard and doing gardening and, and uh, the work that's involved in that. There are so many spiritual elements and aspects that just come to play that the God reminds me of when I'm in the garden because it comes straight from the scripture, some of those principles. We're going to see that today. The vine and the branches. I want to look. Uh, I want to look as we begin at the vine. It is. A, it is a re reference to God. His role. What is it that he's? What is it that he does? What is he doing in our life? What's his function in our life? In, in this word picture for us, it begins with a glimpse at Jesus Himself. We look at verse one. John begins and says, "I am the true vine." As Jesus describes Himself, He describes Himself as the author of life. He is our life. Remember, back at the beginning of chapter 14, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. One of the I am statements of the Lord. He is our source of life. We live and we breathe as a Christian. We live and breathe as a new creation because of who we are in Christ. This metaphor, this word picture, this, this teaching from Jesus to our hearts describes this in detail. So I'm looking forward to, to uh, what it shows for us this morning. All the nutrients, all the energy, the sunshine, the rain, everything that's poured into, into our lives comes through the vine. The vine is essential. This is the picture of a vineyard. I'm not a vineyard. I've not really been around vineyards a lot. I've been around agriculture. The vine is, is, is important to the whole picture here, the branches and the fruit and all that. It is the vine that draws all those nutrients from the soil. And you think about the rain and the sunshine coming uh, into the ground and the fertilizer being put into the ground and the nutrients being added to the ground. Ultimately, in this word picture, all those things would, would appropriately be Christ. He is the one who blesses us, even with those blessings and those resources and, and uh, those things that we need. And then they are filtered through him into our life. So Jesus pictures himself as the very essential core to our life, the very one that we need more than anything else. Then we see the Father... In this verse as well, verse 1, And my father is the vine dresser. He is, he is the, uh, the gardener. Uh, he, he's the caretaker over the garden. He takes care of, of tending the garden. Uh, the vine and the branches and the fruit and all that is a part of that. So the father and the son are working together in tandem. They're working together perfectly and in harmony. And he's taking the work of Jesus Christ and then he's, he's, a, he's bringing the fruit into our life and he's accomplishing in our life the change that, that necessarily takes place because we are connected to Christ. Uh, this is a beautiful picture. In verse 2, we, we see this as we continue. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So the Father's involved and he's, he's looking carefully over, over the vine. He's looking carefully over uh, the branches that are coming out of the vine. And there are branches that are, that are uh, unproductive and that aren't bearing fruit. And what he does is he cuts those off and he takes those away. He removes those branches. So he's carefully looking at, at the, the health of the product. He's looking at what's being produced. And he's looking at and determining what is an essential part of the vine and what is not. What, what is connected to the vine and what is not. We're going to come back to that later in just a second. Also, he says in verse 2, 
and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So as the Father is looking into our life, he's removing branches, and he also is pruning branches. So the, so the branches that, that are not bearing fruit, he cuts off, he takes away. The branches that are producing fruit, he prunes them. So the Father is constantly active and at work in our life. And so the pruning process is very essentially important. If, we, if you work with plants in a garden, with flowers, with anything at all, there is usually a pruning process that's involved. And we're cutting away the things that, that prohibit healthy growth and cutting away the, the branches that are unhealthy and, and whatever that might be. There's always We're shaping so that, so that light can be poured into the essential uh, branches. When, you, when vineyards hire pruners, they hire them sometimes for two or three years to train them, to show them how much to cut, where to cut, even at what angle to cut the branch. That's even very important as well, is what angle to cut it. I can, if I cut it at the wrong angle, I can injure a branch. I can hurt a branch. If I do it the wrong way, I can do damage to the branch. So the Father is perfectly, the Father is lovingly pruning in our lives. That's going to be very important as we look at this, at this illustration this morning from Christ into our life. Ecclesiastes 3, 8 is, is a passage that we are familiar with. It's been made into songs, and, and uh, it's one that we often refer to. Solomon, as he writes these words, these first eight verses, basically he says, there is a season for everything. And so there is a description of all the different phases of life that we walk through, and we find ourselves as we go through life, in these different phases of life. The reality is that in all of these phases, God is pruning. God is doing a work in the life of the believer. He is with purpose uh, bringing things into our life and, and shaping us so that we will be fruitful and productive for the Lord. So we have the vine itself. We have Christ who is our very life. I am the life. We have the Father who is who is cultivating that life, who is enhancing and maximizing the the. The, the product that comes out of that, Jesus and the Father working perfectly together in harmony. And we will see in the, in the course of this final discourse the work of the Spirit. And then we encounter the branches. We are the branches. What is the purpose of the branches? Well, we see in verse 2 clearly, as John continues, he says that it may bear more fruit there at the end of verse 2. The goal of, of the branch is to bear fruit. That is God's goal for every branch to be healthy, to be productive, to be uh, impactful. And so that uh, means that we're going to be pruned. There is, in this picture, there are branches who don't produce fruit, and there are branches who do produce fruit. That's the distinction that is made. We're going to look at that. Two, two clear distinctions in this path, passage. Branches that are producing, branches that are not producing. So let's look at these distinctions a little bit more closely. The first one is, is the reality of abiding. If we come to verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. We are called to abide in Christ. To abide in Christ is, is to have life in Christ, is to be organically connected to Christ, is to stay in that relationship, is to be aware of the presence of God. Uh, each day that I live, is to be aware of what that means and the impact on my life. To abide in Christ is to know that I am that I am connected to Christ, I am committed to Christ, I am obligated to Christ, I am in a love relationship with Christ. That is what abiding is all about. It is life in Christ. It is a daily relationship. And so we are called here in verse 4 to abide. Not only that, um, we are also called to bear fruit. If we look at verse 5, and we've seen that already in verse 2, John continues, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so we are called here uh, in our relationship with God, in that abiding relationship, uh, to bear fruit, to bear much fruit. Uh, we're to be productive. You know, God's desire for every believer is to be productive is to reveal Christ in their life. Every, every believer, every child, every adult, every senior, God's desire is that we bear fruit. Uh, his requirement is that we bear fruit. 
He created us so that we would reflect Christ in our life and that it would show. We do that by being connected. So the Father, what is he doing here? Well, he's, he's overseeing. He's removing branches that aren't producing fruit. He is pruning branches in our life. He's constantly pruning. And the pruning here reveals a relationship. As he's pruning, it reveals that we are connected to Christ. Why is he pruning? Yes, so that we'll bear fruit, but he's pruning because he loves us. He is pruning because he cares for us. He is pruning because the work that he is doing is, the, is for our good. It is for the glory of God. He prunes in our life. He takes things out of our life. He shapes our lives because he is lovingly conforming us to Christ. That's what he's doing. There is a relationship there. It is, it is assumed in the pruning process, but more than that, it is picked up here in John in a way that we don't normally see. Maybe in the English you wouldn't catch it. If you would, look at verse 3. We skipped verse 3. We're going to come back to verse 3 now. John says, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. It kind of seems an odd verse between uh, verse 2 and verse 4 and 5, but it's, it's intricately connected to what uh, the Lord is saying here. The Father is pruning. He's, he's cutting in our lives, and he's taking, he's taking those things out of our lives that would, that would prohibit growth or uh, put us in a place where we would be unhealthy, whatever that might be. He's always, he's always working. Verse 3 reminds us that we are clean because of the Word of God that's been spoken to us. The interesting thing here is the word clean and uh, the word prune, which is in verse 2, is the Greek word kathairo. It's the same word. Pruning and cleaning are the same word, the same Greek word. God prunes us because of the relationship that we have in Christ. He prunes us because we belong to Christ. He prunes us because we're already clean, which means in our position before, before him, he looks upon us and he sees the relationship that we have with him through Christ. He prunes us because we are children of God. We are saved. So that cleaning in verse 3 is essential. It reveals a relationship that is there. John chapter 13, verse 10, as Jesus washed the disciples' feet, Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. And he said to Peter, well, if I don't, you have no fellowship with me, no share with me. And he says, wash my whole body. And Jesus says, you don't need to have your whole body washed. He says, you've already been bathed. You're already clean. You just need your, your feet cleaned. You, you here, it says, you are clean. But not every one of you. Who is that referring to? It's Judas. The 11 disciples are clean. They are children of God. They're saved. They have a relationship with God. Based upon that relationship, then John says here in chapter 15, verse 3, because we're clean, that's why the Father is pruning in our life so that we'll be productive and we'll make a difference for Jesus Christ. We'll be an ambassador for Christ that'll make a difference. The other distinction here is, so you have the branches, you have those who are abiding, those who are connected to Christ, those who are bearing fruit, and then you have those who are not abiding, those who are not connected. Uh, verse 6, let's look at verse 6 together. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch, and he withers, and the branches are gathered and are thrown into the fire, and they are burned. And so there is, there is the other side of the coin in this passage. There are those who are bearing fruit and abiding. They are believers. They're, they're connected to Christ organically. And then there are those who are not bearing fruit. They're not connected to Christ. They're not abiding. And they're not a child of God. This is really essential, and this is really important. And we're going to look at some pieces here. But as we're doing that, I want you to think of Judas, because inherently connected to this passage in the context of the final discourse is the example of Judas. Okay? He says here, every branch in me that, that does not bear fruit, so there is no abiding there, there is no fruitfulness there. And then in verse 4 he reminds us, a branch cannot bear fruit by itself. So if, if, if I'm the branch and I'm disconnected from the vine, I can't bear fruit. If I'm disconnected from, from the essential root, I can't bear fruit. If we cut off a branch, it can't bear fruit. There are those, well, we'll get there in a second. So what's the Father doing here? What is he doing with these branches? Well, he's removed these branches. He's pruned the, the branches who are in Christ. But these branches that are not connected, he gathers them. He takes them, he gathers them, and, and they are burned. Okay? That gives us a picture here. 
Uh, we have those who are not connected to the vine, no life in Christ, no relationship. And here at the end, there is no protection ultimately from, from the wrath of God. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal life, prepared for the devil and his angels. What a, what a sobering, sobering reality this is. The reality of separation from God, of being under the wrath of God. This, this, this picture in John 15 shows us just a glimpse of that. These branches that seem like they are connected to Christ in reality are not. And their end is, is to be separated from Christ. These are not, in this passage, these are not believers who have lost their salvation. Some, some contend that in this passage what's being described is, is here are believers who were cut off from the vine and, and they've lost their salvation. Well, John tells us clearly that's not the case. Chapter 6, verse 37 Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 39, I will lose nothing of all that he has given to me. I will not lose one, not even one branch. I'm going to raise it up on the last day. John 17, 6, you, uh, yours, Father, they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. That's fruit, right? That's, that's abiding. That's results. Um, John 10, Jesus, as the great shepherd, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never, never, never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hands. The security of the believer in Christ, even just in the gospel of John alone, is clearly established. A believer cannot lose their relationship, their connection with Christ, their salvation with Christ. These are not Christians who have lost their salvation. We believe, I believe, the Bible teaches clearly that a believer, a, a believer who is genuinely saved can never lose that relationship, never lose that salvation. These in reality are not genuine believers in the first place. These branches, which might seem confusing at first because it, they're branches in the vine, it appears in this metaphor, clearly. But I want us to look at that because what's taking place is there are those who appear to be organically connected with Christ, but they're not. Okay, John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Many, many believed in Christ. They saw what he was doing, the signs. But Jesus, on his part, he did not commit himself to them. He did not entrust himself to them. He didn't need someone else to give witness to their heart because it says here he himself knew what was in man. He knew their hearts. He knew that they were not genuine in their, in their confession of Christ. John chapter 6. Some of you do not believe, Jesus said. He knew from the beginning those who would not believe and who it was who would betray him. That's Judas. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him because ultimately they were not genuine believers. They were disciples in attraction. They committed to him because of all that he was doing. But in their hearts, they never established a relationship of faith with him. They were never organically connected to Christ. They were drawn to him but never established a relationship through faith. John chapter 8, many believed in him. So Jesus said to these Jews who had believed, if you abide in my words, you are truly my disciples. But he says, you know what? I know that you're the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word has, finds no place in you. So he's saying to them, you have made this verbal commitment to me, but I know in your heart your desire is to kill me. That's not connection. That's not, not organic relationship. That's not faith. Jesus was always able to make that distinction because he knew the heart. John chapter 6, verse 70, speaking to the 12 disciples, he says, one of you is a devil. That's Judas. Judas, Judas here was numbered with the disciples. He did ministry with the disciples. He was, he was connected to all that was going on but he was never a branch that was connected to the vine. It looked like he was. By all intents and purposes, everyone would assume that, Jesus, that, Judas, that Judas was a believer. He did miracles. He did signs. He did wonders. When they went out and they ministered in Matthew 10 and other places, he was a part of that. And he was given opportunity to, 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 to be a part of that and make a difference. And yet he was never organically connected to Christ. And he would become an example to the disciples. Really, the challenge that we all face in our life and in ministry, are we genuinely a child of God? As we minister and seek to, to reach others for Christ, 
to the best of our ability. We strive to understand whether whether a person we're ministering with or ministering to is genuinely a believer. That is the most important thing in the world. Judas in the end was not because his heart was revealed. There are many who th- who say, I have a relationship with Christ. I'm connected to Christ. I've done so many things in my life for Christ. I've worked and I've been religious and I've gone to church and I've read my Bible and I've prayed and I've and I've just I've been good to people and I've met needs and I've done all these things and I've done it for Christ. And Jesus says the one thing that we lack, the one thing that we lack if we don't have a relationship is this. He says, I never knew you, verse 23, Matthew 7. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. The, the, the one thing that reveals real life is, is that knowledge relationship. Hebrews 6 reminds us that uh, there are those who are once enlightened. In the end of those verses, they are burned. They don't have that relationship with Christ. Verse 9 says, but in your case, the author, as he's writing, he says, you know what? But in your case, beloved, you are, you are saved. You have a connection. You, you, are not, you are not these people that are described in verses 4 through 8. Second Timothy reminds us that the Lord knows who belongs to him. He understands that. He knows everyone. He calls us to faith in Christ, John 6. John 3, John 8. He calls us to, to faith in Christ. He calls us to believe. Uh, genuine faith. Lord, I give my life to you. Lord, I trust you. So what's the evidence of that life? How do you know? Well, let's look at the evidence of abiding. Because John gives us gives us assurance that we can know that we belong to Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, the key here is, is the word of God is active in our life. If I'm a genuine child of God, the word of God is active in my life. The word is, is filtering in my, into my life. It's flowing into my life. In verse 7, he continues and he says, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. There is, there is prayer. There is power in prayer. Um, oops, there we go. And, and God is at work. And we have that vital connection through prayer. Verse 8, which we just had. John says, By this is my Father glorified. When we abide, when we're in His Word, then God is being honored. And if you're a genuine child of God, that's, that's your heartbeat. To honor God in everything that you do. That is a mark of a genuine believer. We also see in verse, in verse 2 that we're to bear fruit. Bearing fruit. We're to bear more fruit. Um, and then here in verse 8, we are to bear much fruit. That is the call of the believer. Every branch is expected to bear fruit. And when you are bearing fruit, that is a, that is a mark of assurance in your life. Verse, verse 8 continues, and uh, John says this, and, this, and so you prove, you reveal, you show that you are my disciple. Uh, there is assurance of salvation. As you see God at work in your life, there is an assurance that comes into your life. Verses 9, let's look at verses 9 through 10. John writes, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Another, another element of, of assurance in our life is, is that there is a love relationship with Christ. We're commanded to love him. We're commanded to love one another. Uh, he is indeed our, our, our friend. He showed that by laying down his life for us. Um, love defines us. When we love God, when we love others biblically, um, that is an affirmation in your life. When there, when there is a, a commitment to, to be biblical, to love his word, to love his commandments, uh, to love others, that is, a, that is an affirmation. Jesus says, as the Father loved, so have I loved. We're to abide in that love. To love him is to keep his commandments, to take his word. It's to honor it, it's to obey it, to love his word, to love as he did. Verse 11, John says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Another affirmation of simply being in Christ is the joy of the Lord. Just the, just the joy of the Lord. Just the experience of walking with the Lord. And the blessings of, of that, the, the riches of that, of trusting the Lord and having joy even when we're being pruned and being tested. And then verse 15, 
We, John shares these words. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. We're no longer servants, we're friends. He says, everything that the father desired for me to share while on this earthly ministry, and even now, that's exactly what I've done. I have shared 100% of what the Father has asked me to share in my ministry with the world and ultimately with you who are in Christ. We are servants of Jesus Christ. That never changes. We never, we are always, uh, that word doulos in the Greek, slaves of Jesus Christ, servants of Jesus Christ, but we're more than that. We are a friend of Christ, and because we are, he communicates to us. These are all affirmations. When you're reading his word and the word is touching your heart, God is communicating with you. He's, he's, he's showing you that that relationship is, is organic, it's vital, it's essential. When the Spirit of God takes the word of God and, and uh, prompts you in your life and encourages you in your life, refreshes and comforts, that is God being a friend to you and to I. When God is alive in our life, that is God being our friend. When he communicates to us, gives us wisdom, that is God being our, our, our friend. That is important. So let's, let's, let's summarize what it means to abide, what it means to bear fruit. I want us to look at that. Let's look at verse 16. So we come to verse 16, and John says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should re- abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He has chosen us and he has appointed us. By grace, he has chosen us. Um, Not of our own. Salvation is is not of our own effort, not of our own doing. It's not of works. It's God's work in our life. He he pours the faith into our life and gives us the ability to turn to him. And he appoints us and he calls us to a task. In verse 16, that we should go and we should bear fruit. And that our fruit should should remain, it should be uh, vital and filled with life and make a difference for the, for the kingdom of God, for, for the cause of Christ, for Jesus Christ himself. So we're to be fruit bearers. We're to, we're to be productive. Every child of God, every branch that is in the vine is productive and, and bearing fruit. Every one. There is not a Christian a genuine Christian who is not expected to bear fruit. There is not a genuine Christian who will, who will not bear fruit. Jesus says if you have an organic connection to Christ, Christ is going to be working in your heart and the results are going to come out in your life. That is an essential requirement of being a child of God. Let's look at that as we close here. Galatians is a reminder to us of the fruit of the Spirit. This fruit is a work of the Spirit of God. Whatever, whatever fruit comes out of my life, whatever results come out of my life that draw people to Christ, it is a work of the Spirit of God. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. They're all a work. It's all essential. They're, they're all transforming our life. It is a divine work. Jesus is at work in your life and mine. And he, takes the, he takes the Word of God and He produces Christ in our life the results of Christ in our life. As the Father prunes in our life, those those resources that God pours into my life, God reminds us, uh, Peter reminds us in, in 2 Peter 1, 3, God says, I've given you everything that you need for life and for godliness. That's this. That's the life of Jesus Christ flowing into us. Everything we need for every day, for every moment, for every trial, for every decision is the life of Christ pouring into us as God's promise to you and I. Luke chapter 3 reminds us that really the first fruit that we encounter, that we bear, that we, that we experience is when we receive Jesus Christ. When we, when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we confess our sins and we repent of our sins. That's the very first step. That's the step of faith. And we turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I believe you by faith. I give my life to you. You are the only one who can change my life and save me. You are the only one who can forgive me. You are the only one who can wash my sins away. That is the very first fruit of a believer, to have the the peace and and the transformation that comes because of the work of repentance. And we're we're always to be uh, practicing the need to repent and to, and to be right before the Lord. Hebrews 13 reminds us that praise is a fruit of the Lord. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. 
acknowledge his name in our conversation and in our days. Luke chapter 8 reminds us that fruit comes out of good soil. Good soil is essential. A believer grows and a a believer produces the, the results and the fruit of the word of God in their life because they're good soil. When God is doing something in your life and it's evident, it just shows that the soil of your heart is good. And that God has something to work with. But he has something to work with because he's been working in your life. And so we just praise him and we give him glory. If God is, is meaningful to us and special to us and touching our heart and moving our heart and using us, he is the one who has created that good soil, not us. Oh, we've opened our heart to his word. And we have yielded and listened and been teachable. But God is the one who has been cultivating that soil. Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us that uh, discipline is a part of that fruit. Discipline could be another word for pruning. Discipline is, is, involves that concept of pruning. When Jesus is working in our life and the Father is working in our life, sometimes he disciplines us and he corrects us so that we come back on the right path. The result of that here in these verses is it's, it's painful, but it teaches me the holiness of God. It reminds me and it brings into my life uh, the peace of being right with God again. And it trains me. We're always training our plants so that they grow the right way, so that the vine follows where it needs to grow. And and this is, is often a part of that. It comes through pruning. It's, it's painful, but it's rewarding in our life. And this is a beautiful picture. This is what God is doing in our life. He's constantly lovingly holding us, cutting away, pouring his life into us, so that we can grow and be like Christ. That's really the goal. Colossians, Colossians 1 reminds us, we're to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, being fully pleasing to him. The fruit is this, the fruit in my life, in your life, is this, that we're walking with Christ, that we are pleasing him, that your life is pleasing to the Lord, that your choices are pleasing to the Lord, that how you treat people, it pleases the Lord. How you view the world around you, it pleases the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit of God, using the Word of God, the life of Christ in us, the pruning and the loving work of the Father, the result of that is that we honor God. We are pleasing Him. I trust that's true in your life right now and this morning. Matthew 13 reminds us that that the fruit is meant to grow. It's meant to yield. It's meant to be productive, to continue to grow more and more and more and more. And every day we're to be more fruitful and every day we're to make a difference for, the, for Christ. Um, this whole thing of bearing fruit, of being productive for Christ, of reflecting Christ in our life, it's, it's consistent with how the Word of God teaches us. Mark chapter 4 is, is the parable of the sower and the seed. Three of those, three of those gra- uh, soils that the seed is, is thrown onto and cast onto fail to produce fruit. It's only the last one, the good soil that produces fruit. That's consistent with what we see here is as Jesus teaches in John chapter 15. Ultimately, it is only the genuine believer who will produce fruit, who will, who will live out Christ in their life, where Christ will be seen in their life. Is Christ seen in your life? Do others, do others see the results of Christ living in you? If they don't, then these pictures tell us we need to be careful that we, that we have a relationship with Christ. We may need to revisit, where do I stand with Christ? Do I know Jesus Christ as my Savior? We're to hear the word, we're to accept it, and we're bear fruit. The key to bearing fruit is the word of God in our life. In verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. To abide is to love biblically. Um, it is that relationship with love. We love because he first loved us. Love becomes, becomes an assurance of salvation in our life. 1 John 3, verses 14 and 18, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. And we love in deed and in truth. Our love is authentic. Assurance of salvation is abiding. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If the word of God is flowing into my life and I love it and I, and I, can't, and I can't make it without the word of God being a part of my life, that is evidence in my life of, of a genuine relationship with Christ. John 15, 8, and this verse is here, reminds me that 
bearing fruit is evidence. And so you prove, you reveal, you show that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. As we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, we're to walk in Christ. Christ is to be our life. Our life is to be Christ-centered. We're to honor Christ in everything. We're to be grounded in Christ in everything. Galatians 3, it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. A Christ-centered life is a fruitful life. It's a productive life. When I yield to him, when I love as he would have me to love, when I'm grounded in his word, I'm growing. I trust that's you this morning. I trust you have confidence as you look in your life that what you're doing and how you're living, it reveals that Christ is in you. Your first allegiance, your first love is Christ. And, uh, and it's reflected in how you live your life. This, this picture this morning reminds us that, that there is a clear distinction. Those to whom that is the value, that is the importance, Christ in my life, and those who say, I'm going to live for Christ, but I'm going to do it my own way, as Judas did and so many others do, and will stand before Christ and say, Lord, I did all these things, and you'll say, I never knew you. I trust this morning you know Christ is your Savior, and you have that assurance. Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would just touch each, each heart. Uh, would you move each heart into an examination and relationship before you? Lord, the one who's listening this morning, might they just look into their own life and just be able to say, Lord, I know you because your word is in my life. I have an organic relationship with Christ. I desire to honor the Lord, to have a Christ-centered life, to please him in all that I do. Our Lord, I'm not sure where I stand with you. None of those things are true in my life right now. I'm not pursuing you. You're, the results of Christ, they're not in my life. I'm living for myself. Lord, I pray that uh, you would just draw that heart to the Savior, that this morning they would confess their need for you and receive Christ as Savior. Move in our hearts as only you can. Use us for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.